Join us on one of the most spectacular adventures on Earth, trekking high up into the Peruvian Andes to one of the wonders of the world. Four days of hiking through valleys shrouded in mystery and up over dizzying high passes. This journey takes us through the heart of the ancient Incan Empire. With unforgettable scenery, from glacial-capped mountains to lost jungle, revealing ancient ruins and hidden stories of an age forgotten by time. Finally, after trekking through darkness, we arrive in the early morning light to a place considered one of the most breathtaking of all the wonders of the world. We learn about its secrets and marvels before heading to the highest viewpoint that fewer tourists dare to conquer. It's no wonder this is considered one of the greatest journeys on Earth. Join us in Peru, hiking the Inca Trail to Machu Picchu. We continue from our previous video where we traveled north from Lake Titicaca to Cusco, exploring Rainbow Mountain and the Sacred Valley. So we are officially on the first day of the classic Inca Trail. This is the one that leads to Machu Picchu. It's about 35 kilometers over four days. Today is only a short one at about 11. Should be good though. So right now we're following the Urumbamba River in the Quechua name it was Wilcamayo and that was the same name they gave to the Milky Way so there is some sort of astrological relationship between the river and the sky, the astronomy above. This river here actually leads to the Amazon River which by volume is the largest river in the world so we're heading to the eastern side of the Andes over this, the course of this journey and that will lead us towards the, the foothills of the Andes or at least getting closer to the Amazon itself so it's starting to get thicker and wetter in this area. Along the trail, we were entranced by the variety of hummingbird species, including the green and white hummingbird only endemic to this specific area of the Peruvian Andes. Here, our guide Nelton gives us a tutorial on how to most effectively chew coca leaves. Put in your cheek. It could be on the right side, it could be on the upper part or down. It doesn't matter. You just need to keep it. Or you can just use your tongue to fix it, press a little bit and suck it. So there is an Incan ruin, our first Incan ruin for the trip just on our right hand side here which is known as Canabamba but that's not the actual name of the site. The Incan names have been lost. This place here they, they say would have been a stop on the way on the trails that all ran through these valleys here. So this is one of the many trails that are in the region here. There are hundreds and hundreds of trails, eight of which lead to Machu Picchu and this trail that we're doing, what is so special about it is that it was the trail used by the Royal or at least that's what they think anyway the world to use this trail so it's probably one of the best established trails and it's completely covered and steeped in history we make a short stop at one of the last villages on the trail <laughs> He's so cute. nobody just playing. <laughs> <laughs> Little baby puppy teeth. A few years ago, back in 2014, I did the Lara's track, which was one of the other trails that leads to Machu Picchu. 
That was not the classic trail, however, it is a beautiful trail and I highly recommend doing it if you're into peace and nature and scenery. However, I chose to do this trail this time with Miranda because we wanted to learn a little bit more about the Incan culture along the way. So we're going to see a lot of different ruins and learn a lot about Incan culture on this trail to one of the wonders of the world. Below we have the second largest site on the Inca Trail, it's called Yactapapa, which was a name given by Fernando Astete in the 1940s. The original name obviously is lost. This was an agricultural society down here and you can see the terraces there that faced the east to collect the sun from the east to keep the, the farming crops warm overnight when it can freeze below zero there. That's part of the agricultural techniques that they used back in those days, but they were able to actually supply places like Machu Picchu with the crops that were grown here in this area. And the area that we're in up at the top here, these were called colkas. And the colkas were basically storage pits. So the Incas knew to dehydrate the food for seasons and periods where there might be drought or famine. And they kept them up here in these storage pits. Now you can see two sections here below of the city. The upper section was for the upper class, which were known as the Inca. So the Inca were just the high class, the royalty. And the lower class down there, they were the Quechua people. So the Quechua is the current name for the people that inhabit the area today, the descendants of the Inca. And it comes from that word. So there were the two different classes. And there was a third class as well, the Yamanis, which were the people that were integrated into Incan society from other villages. Uh, the Incans basically had a bit of a, f a philosophy. They would come to the, the civilizations or the small villages around and they would either reward them by giving them the technology if they chose to join or they would go to war. So more often than not, you'd have these civilizations or these small villages joining up with the Incan culture and really making it larger. Okay, so we've just passed our final village for the Inca Trail. So the first day, there's a number of little villages that you'll stop at. There's a lot of drinks and snacks and a lot of these guys here. Hello. And uh, now we are heading up to our campsite for the night. up to Dead Woman's Pass, which is the highest point of the Inca Trail, at 4,220 meters high. We should be there pretty soon. We're making very good timing today. And yeah, today's the longest and most strenuous day, but it should be good. Yeah, we're doing well. We're fine. We're cruising. up at Dead Woman's Pass. These higher sections of the Andes are usually prone to really extreme weather conditions, wind and rain. But this summer here in South America, 
they've actually ex experienced really extreme drought, very, very dry seasons. In fact, in our three or so months of travel in South America, we've had like two days of rain. So we're at Dead Woman's Pass. <laughs> I'm not sure exactly where the dead woman is <laughs> or what is supposed to represent the dead woman. It's pretty cloudy up here. Can't really see a whole lot. And um, I was talking about droughts before, but we are on the edge of one of the wettest places on Earth. So it's very likely that it could rain, especially as we're getting up higher here. I have one of the local... <laughs> you have the Oreos. I have one of the local passion fruits here. This is, uh, this is native to the area. And I have... The... Look at that inside. It's all seeds. Miranda, get away from it. <laughs> okay, so we're just leaving Dead Woman's Pass right now, which is 4,215 meters, the highest point of the Inca Trail, and we're descending down into nothingness. <laughs> so the reason why they call it Dead Woman's Pass has got to do with the profile. It's a little hard to see from this angle, but that there is supposed to be her breast and up a little bit higher is her face. So when we get down the bottom, hopefully the clouds will clear a little bit and we'll actually get to see the profile of the dead woman. This food. I need to like document how good the food is in this place. <laughs> Everyone's happy. Okay, so we've just finished lunch, and I must say that the food with Alpaca Expeditions has been nothing short of phenomenal. Our guide Nilton was saying at the beginning that you're not gonna lose weight on this trek, the amount that you eat, and I'm starting to believe him. So we are actually ascending up to the next pass, which I believe is called Rankuro Kai. I could be wrong, but uh, there are apparently some Incan sites and ruins up near there. So I'm gonna learn a little bit more about that after we finish these steps called the Gringo Killer, or at least that's what Nilsson was calling it. I thought these Incans were short people, but these steps are pretty big. And these are authentic steps from the Inca period, which is pretty awesome. So below me there is the Incan site of Runkurakai, which was an outpost for people known as the Chaskis. And Chaskis were the official messengers of the Incan Empire. They were basically chosen at birth for their role as the messengers, and they would be trained up from a young age to be fast runners and efficient through these Andean mountains. They worked in kind of like a relay service, so one messenger maybe would come from Machu Picchu, relay the message to another guy, and on forth to places like Cusco. In fact, these guys were so efficient that they could essentially run the whole Inca Trail in just a few hours. They could even make their way from Quito up in Ecuador all the way down to Cusco in Peru in about a week. So they were pretty well known for being uh, athletic and, and really, really sturdy, much like the porters today. In fact, they hold an annual competition here to run the Inca Trail and the record was broken by a 
Porter. Now we take four days to do this Inca trail here and they the record broken was three hours and 37 minutes. And I kind of want to acknowledge the hard work that they do because these guys are really, really doing it rough compared to us. You know, we might be taking five or 10 kilograms on our back, but these guys are taking up 25 kilograms. When we get to camp and we rest, these guys are actually still working, setting up, preparing our meals, setting up our tents, all that sort of stuff. And the reason why they do it, the reason why they do this hard work is because they come from backgrounds where they don't have as much money or as many opportunities as we have. A lot of them are indigenous people and it's their way of being able to put their children into a better education. So in order to have some of the things we take for granted in the Western world, these guys here are essentially working harder than we'll ever work or harder than our parents have even ever worked, you know? So you have to really acknowledge how hard they are working. And one of the reasons why we chose Alpac Ex Expeditions is because they have a reputation of really looking after their porters um, and obviously sustainable and a very ethical company. So it's something that we really looked into beforehand and we thought was very, very important when choosing who to go with for the Inca Trail. How you doing, Chiki? Headache's starting to disappear. That's good. Uh, getting a little altitude headache in the back of my head there. It's kind of strange. I had a lot of energy and legs are strong. My breath was okay, not right now because I've just climbed steps, but I was getting this throbbing headache in the back of my head. So I sat down for a bit and drank a lot of water. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about altitude sickness because it is a serious thing up here on the high Andes. I've been at much higher than this before, never experienced anything, but today I've been starting to really feel it. Just a constant headache in the back of my head. Um, I'll stop for a little bit and it'll disappear, but once I start up again, it comes back, which is really frustrating because energy wise, I feel like I have a lot of energy to keep going. but. Uh, the important thing is to drink a lot of water. I've taken an ibuprofen. We're almost at the top, so we'll get back down. We're all, I think we're just under 4,000 meters at the moment. And um, yeah, I think the other thing we've got as well, which is kind of important to have is Diamox, which is a medication that is supposed to, I think, um, circulate your red blood cells or thin your blood in a way that uh, keeps your heart pumping and circulating more of the good stuff, the oxygen that we're not getting enough of up here. Probably shouldn't talk and walk. <laughs> That's probably one of the, the reasons why I'm getting this so much. Maybe I'm suffering for this video. at the ancient Incan site of Siamaka and up behind me here we have an altar. The altar is an actual natural rock form that is shaped almost like a human figure, at least that's what the Inca saw it as. You can see a head up here, you can see some arms down here and some legs, which they worshipped as the god Wiracocha. Got two little uh, windows either side for offerings as well. They create the balance between dark and, dark and light. And this little altar area here would have been for uh, offerings of coca leaves and corn, potatoes, the best food that they had to offer for the gods. But uh, the site here of Siamaka was never found by the Spanish, which is why it is completely intact. It was never destroyed. Uh, in fact, there is only one small little wall up there where you can actually see the reconstruction. The rest of it is completely intact uh, as it would have been when the city itself was abandoned. There are seven windows at the top there too and those seven windows are lined up during the June-July period with the uh, different constellations, the Big Dipper and Scorpio which represented two different serpents. And the wall itself here 
also lined up with the solstice there, the winter solstice on the 21st of June. So everything has astrological alignment as well. Uh, this was a very important city. Uh, it may have been used as a, a fortress on the, the road down to Machu Picchu. It was definitely not an agricultural city because there are no agricultural sites around here. So everything would have been imported in from some of the other sites we saw earlier. But it's um, absolutely amazing to see some of these places intact. And it's only a lead up to what we're going to see when we get to Machu Picchu. The following morning, our guide Nelton gave us an introduction to our porters. We carry now 25 kilograms. This is still a lot, right? Yeah. But back in the day, they were carrying about 35, 40, 45 kilograms, and that's about about 100 pounds or maybe more than 100 pounds. No, now these people are they have a better, I would say, infrastructure. For example, provided by the company. You know, they also have you no know, proper gear that they can work with and deal in this hard work, you know? Being a part is not easy, you no? Know? And all of everybody, guys, these guys here, they come from the countryside. They're not from the city. But now, I want to actually introduce now our chefs. We actually, they have been doing a great job, guys. All right, so we are on the third day of the Inca Trail, which is probably the most scenic day, and it's also the shortest day, so it's usually people's favorite day. Behind us here, we have Salcantay, which is one of the highest peaks in the area. And Salcantay was a very sacred mountain for the Inca people because of the glacier that sits on top. That glacier provided them with the water that they could produce their crops and sustain the life in the area, so they used to use it as a place of worship. Essentially, they would leave offerings to the gods up on top of those mountains in the form of children. Now, it sounds harsh and it sounds like this is some evil empire that are just sacrificing children, but in their belief, it was something for the greater good of the people. And the children, they would offer themselves freely because of the education of the religion that they had. They believed that they were doing something noble for their families, for their for their civilization and they would have these week-long ceremonies that would celebrate these children as offerings and then they would take them to the top of the mountains where they were essentially drugged with a whole bunch of different plants and herbs in the region and then left as the offering for the mountain along the trail here which is completely authentic Inca trail never has been uh, refurbished or changed on the trail we can see these sentry towers. These sentry towers were used to relay messages from one spot to the other using large cone shells as horns. So you can see how the Incas strategically chose the spots to build their cities and that has to do with the sunlight actually hitting the top of the hill first thing in the morning. And you can imagine with the golden features on the temple, it would have reflected off there like gold, which is absolutely stunning. The Incas believed that the gold was the blood of the sun. So that was actually a really important thing for them in a spiritual context and silver represented the moon. Inside the Inca tunnel. This is pretty cool. You see the porters running down. <laughs> that was Nilton. You're on camera now, Nilton. So to the Inca, these mountains over here were known as Pumasilla, or the Puma's Claw. Behind was the last refuge of the Incas, known as Vilcabamba. 
after the Spanish invaded, they pretty much retreated up into the mountains, what was remaining of the Inca Empire. For about 40 years, they held their revolt from just behind these mountains, or at least that's what it's believed to be the last refuge, or the Spanish believed was the last refuge. There are rumors and tales that the Inca continued proceeding into the mountains, maybe even down into the Amazon, and hid out in the mountains for many more years. And one of the reasons why they believe that is because a lot of the idols that were taken from a lot of the important temples, the golden idols that the Spanish prize, were never found. So down below in the valley, you can see the town of Aguascalientes, which is at the base of Machu Picchu, and that is where we are finishing our journey tomorrow afternoon. the Incan site of Puyu Patamaca, which could have been a couple of things. One, a watchtower for Machu Picchu, just behind us down there. Can't quite see the city yet, but the mountain itself is exposed. The other thing which it would have definitely been used for is an astronomical place. And I've already spoken a little bit about how important the stars are for the Incan people. But from this spot here, you can see the Milky Way across the sky all year long in different places of course as the earth revolves and moves around for them the milky way was a very very important place negative images in the shadows could be seen of serpents and llamas in fact the llama which was outlined in black in that negative image was a very very important animal for them not only for carrying and for uh, pretty much moving all of their equipment from town and place to place but also as well the black llamas were revered. Pretty much a representation of that negative image seen within the Milky Way. Now, an interesting thing about the uh, society that lived here as well in, in Incan society in general is that they all saw each other as equals, aside from, of course, the royalty. Uh, they were brothers and sisters. Everybody was family, essentially. That's how they saw each other. They didn't actually have a currency, so what they used to do is trade their goods and services with each other in more of a sharing kind of manner. So that was kind of a way to, to keep loyalty within one another. Unfortunately, they disappeared. A lot of the Incans disappeared when the Spanish conquistadors came through and uh, committed the largest genocide in history here in, in the Americas. Uh, they wiped out about 90% of the population. Uh, a lot of the Incan people stayed in small little towns and villages up here in the mountains. Some uh, retreated down to the Amazon, which is the rainforest at the end of these mountains here. So we're actually trekking downwards now. We're heading down towards the Amazon. In fact, we are pretty much on the border between the Andes Mountains, which we've come from, those big high mountains up there, and the Amazon jungle. So we're gonna go through some lush jungle and lush forest right now. The eastern side tends to get a lot more precipitation. A lot of the weather systems come in through from the east and dump rain down on this side and feed to the world's largest river by a mass. down from the high Andes through the jungle, we've reached the Incan site of Intipata.
So we're at the Incan agricultural site of Intipata, which is one of the four main agricultural sites in the region. This one here was probably the one that most likely would have served Machu Picchu directly, the city of Machu Picchu, which is not too far from here actually. So we're heading down to camp, we're going to have some lunch in camp, and then after that we are going to check out another Incan site. So we are at the Incan agricultural site of Winyawina, and like the one we saw a little bit earlier today, this site here would have serviced Machu Picchu and some of the surrounding Incan cities with its agricultural produce. Now some of the agricultural practices that were quite interesting is the way that they developed and used fertilizers as well, so they could use alpaca and llama fertilizer. Guinea pig fertilizer or guinea pig um, droppings of course. That's what I'm talking about. Guano from bats and from seabirds as well, which is highly prized in this area. And uh, a whole range of other things. So they had quite quite advanced agricultural techniques. Now the name Winye Wana is of course not the Incan name as we've gone through before. We don't actually know the traditional names for a lot of these sites, but the name comes from 1941 when a man named Paul Fejos, a Hungarian explorer, was coming through these air areas and uncovering some of these sites. And much like here in Bingham, which we'll learn a little bit more about tomorrow with Machu Picchu, uh, he basically took as many of the treasures from the sites as he could. And a lot of these early explorers weren't just archaeologists, they were kind of like robbers in a way. That's why you can find Incan treasures all around the world, some of which Peru is trying to get back, and it's this ongoing process of getting their heritage and their cultural items back, but a lot of countries around the world claim that they belong to those countries now, and sit in museums all around the world. So you can see here all of the fountains that used to run all the way down through here for the irrigation. So the question is, how does a civilization this advanced and this grand become conquered in pretty much no time at all? And it had to do a lot with the political situation at the time when the Spanish actually did arrive. So this is back in 1531 and there was a civil war going on here between two sides of the Incan Empire. We had in here in the south Cusco and up in Ecuador we had Quito and the two different parts of the Incan Empire were at war with each other. It was essentially the two sons of Pachacultec, the warrior that we were talking about a little bit earlier that pretty much brought in the golden age of the Incan Empire and whose two sons were fighting over who would have dominance of the Inca Empire itself. Now, when the Spanish did arrive, they actually kidnapped some of the people from the coastline here and they took them back to Spain and they were able to teach them Spanish. When they did, they found out a lot of the political tensions and also a lot of the information about the cities and where they were located, along with the treasures that they held. Now, the Spanish mainly prized things like gold and a lot of the other jewels here and that was their main motivation for coming here and pretty much conquering the Americas. There was a man named Pizarro he was the one that led these expeditions. In fact, he was the second cousin of Hernan Cortes, well known for the uh, takeover of Tenochtitlan and the betrayal of Montezuma, the ruler in Mexico City. And Pizarro, he, he was basically in competition with his cousin for the favor of the Spanish crown. So he basically came down here with this knowledge and he manipulated one of the leaders, the leader here in Quito kidnapped him and held him for ransom. Now the ransom was that if enough gold and treasures could be retrieved, 
that he would be able to return the the leader. Uh, when he received those treasures, he actually demanded more. After demanding more and receiving more treasures, he decided to side with Cusco and kill the leader. After siding with Cusco, the leader Wanakapa became allied with the Spanish. He ended up dying of smallpox, one of the many diseases that the Spanish actually brought in and wiped out a good chunk of the population as well. His son, Manco Inca, then became the next emperor at the age of 16 and basically became the puppet of the Spanish Empire. It allowed them to come in and pretty much steal anything they wanted to rape, to pillage, to do whatever they deemed freely to do. And at the age of 19, three years later, he decided to flee up to the mountains that we were talking about a little bit earlier before. On a side note, when the Incan Emperor Manco Inca took off to Vilcobamba up in the mountains up here, he took with him as much gold and treasure and the idols he could find along the way to hide away from the Spanish because he knew that's exactly what the Spanish were coming for. When the Spanish finally arrived up in Vilcobamba, they didn't find any of this sort of stuff and it led to the lost city of El Dorado. And that's exactly what Hiram Bingham thought he had found when he discovered Machu Picchu back in 1911. What are we doing? So we're currently waiting at the checkpoint now to get into Machu Picchu. It is now 5 o'clock in the morning and we will have extra early at 3.30 to get here. And we were the first ones here, so we'll be the first ones at the sun game. Keen as beans, right? Keen as beans. <laughs> on what is known as the Gringo Killer. Look at that. Woo. Feature right there, one of the seven wonders of the world. Let's do it. So this is Wine Picchu that we'll be doing a, a little later on. Incas, they built this city, guys, and it wasn't just like a city. It was a holy area because you can find different kinds of shrines for all these different kinds of deities, like the sun, like the moon, like the earth, water, and more, right? And here's where they would leave some offerings like cocoa leaves, like some kind of food, no? Like some grain, some, some potatoes, some corn, right? Different kinds of things. And this is why that nowadays people still leave some offerings, like they leave some cocoa leaves. Oh, yeah. You know? They put it there and they just leave it with a stone, no? Something that you guys will find in the Andes, near the glaciers, no? Uh, I would say pile stones, no? That they build after they make the offering. Machu Picchu. <laughs> Should we take a Machu picture? <laughs> this is a llama. These are two llamas. These are two happy llamas. And these are two very happy llamas. <laughs> 
<laughs> that one Nilton told me. So they've got some new rules here since COVID at Machu Picchu, just to be able to maintain the site a little bit better. Some of the things we were allowed to do last time I was here back in 2014 are no longer allowed like walking through the grass areas or even just jumping. Milton, Milton was saying before that uh, the Machu Picchu they found is shrinking by about seven centimetres every single year because of people jumping and doing silly things. So they want to sort of prevent erosion. Uh, other things are selfie sticks. People have died taking selfies up here, wandering off the, the edge and uh, holding flags. There's a whole bunch of stuff that you're not allowed to do up here anymore, but it's all for the maintenance of the site because it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site and it's a very important site for the world of course. Welcome to Peru. Hey. Welcome to Cusco, Machu Picchu, which you guys are now in one of the seven new ones of the world, right? Machu Picchu, of course, it's one of them. And we have one in Central America, Mexico, Chichen Itza. Chichen Itza. We have one in Brazil, Price the Rimmer. One in Peru, Cusco, Machu Picchu. One in Europe, no? The Coliseum in Rome. India, Taj Mahal, Petra, no, in Jordan, and the other one, last one, is Great Wall of China. Great Wall of China. So those are the seven new wonders of the world, and you guys are now in the best between all of them. However, let's talk first of all about the guy who discovered this place. Mr. Hiram Bingham, the professor, this guy who was from Honolulu, Hawaii, originally, but he actually moved down here to South America in 1906. And the main reason that he moved here, guys, was to follow and research more about, you no know, Simon Bolivar. Well, he was exploring here in South America. He was, you no, know, in Argentina first. Then years later, he moved to Chile, Bolivia, and finally in 1909 is the year that he landed to Peru, no? Of course, a few years that he was spending here, he hear rumors about, no, the last refuge of the Incas. Vilcabamba, it was the name, well, actually, is the name of the place that this guy was trying to find for years. Between 1909 to 1911, it took him about I mean, three years, actually, that he was trying to find this place, but he never found what he was looking for, Vilcabamba. Instead, he found Machu Picchu in 1911 on July 24. This Inca buildings has been lasting for years. You have to know that these buildings, guys, they've been here for about 600 years. Started like with bigger stones or big blocks of stones at the bottom, and it's going higher, the size of the stone decreases, right? Look at that. And they're more flatter, more rectangular, I would say. Mm -hmm. And the way how the stones clean no, closely, guys, each other is insane. Mm -hmm. yeah. The way how the, the stones are so precise, use this type of the style of architecture for the priest's house or for the priest. They have to change no matter what, no matter how important was this person, even for their architectures. Because from this point to the corner is the temple of the sun. It's important. This side of this same stone is larger than the other side. And it happens totally the opposite on the second level. Look at that. This is short and the other one is large. Large, short, short, large. So last time I was here at Machu Picchu, this road behind us here where all the buses come up was actually closed due to a massive landslide that occurred one or two days beforehand. So we actually had to hike up this little trail here from the very bottom, which took probably a couple of hours to get up. But one of the cool things about it is we left so early that we actually got up to the top before all the people that came down from the Sun Gate, like ourselves today, and we had the whole place to ourselves. So we had all our pictures with no people. Not to say that today wasn't as special, if not, it was much more special, you know, actually feeling like we earned it. And that's one of the main things about the Inca Trail is that when you do get here finally, you feel like the reward is there, you know, you've really truly got it. So not to put down people who get the bus up, but you know, it's always better to, to go through the challenge and get to the end and deserve that reward.
So right now we are hiking up Wainapichu, which is the big mountain that sits there at the back of Machu Picchu. This is not a separate entrance fee. Currently it's 75 US dollars to do this hike. I didn't get to do it last time, which is why I'm doing it today, but it's uh, supposed to be a bit of a killer. Looking at 300 odd meters of straight up elevation. They call them the stairs of death. Luckily, from what I read, nobody has died on the stairs of death, but it's supposed to be very steep and narrow. So here we go. We've got a few nervous people in our group. How you doing, Glenn? Oh, I'm great. <laughs> Never been better. At least we can't say it's altitude, hey? Yep. <laughs> <sighs> Okay, so we're almost at the top and this is where it gets really narrow and steep. Oh, this is what they call the stairs of death. I'm gonna stop filming now. Guys, you can do it! 750 stone steps lead the way to the top of the mountain known as Wainapichu, which translates to young or new mountain. Some researchers believe this was the original name of Machu Picchu. Here at Huayna Picchu, 2,667 meters above sea level. So Machu Picchu is the true definition of a lost city. It remained hidden here in the jungle for almost 400 years until it was rediscovered by Hiram Bingham in 1911. Excavation work started immediately and it took four years for them to uncover the vast majority of the city itself. From this epic vista, we return back to the ancient city. So they think that Machu Picchu was built for about 5,000 people, the population, but the agricultural terraces around here are only enough for about 300, which means a lot of the sites that we went through on our way up here on the Inca Trail were actually built specifically to supply Machu Picchu. The purpose of the city is a bit of a mystery. They're not sure exactly why it was built, but it was only about 70% complete when the Spanish arrived into the area and it most likely was abandoned around then. It took roughly 70 years to build old Machu Picchu as we see it today. The reconstruction here is quite minimal, only about 20% of the site itself has been reconstructed. Some of the reasons why they built Machu Picchu on the mountaintops was to actually get away from the humidity, the flooding and landslides that take place down in the valleys below. And also it brought them close to their gods. Now this worked in their benefit because when the Spanish did arrive, they passed through the valleys below, but they never actually saw Machu Picchu up here on the mountaintop, which is one of the reasons why it was never found, never destroyed and never conquered. These days we have quite strict regulations here with Machu Picchu, but back in the 80s and 90s, people were able to land helicopters here for special events. They also filmed commercials up here. In fact, there was a beer commercial that they filmed up here which destroyed some of the original structure. So nowadays, obviously, it's a lot more strict and a lot more focused on preserving places like this because it is an important place not only for Peru, but for humanity. This is a World Heritage listed area. We would like to thank Alpaca Expeditions, along with our guides Nilton and Marisol, for the perfect expedition on the Inca Trail. After a celebratory lunch and pisco sour in the township of Aguas Calientes, we returned to Cusco by train. 
Our next video will explore in more depth the ancient Incan capital of Cusco, where we undertake exquisite culinary and historical adventures, followed by a journey to the second Andean capital of Arequipa. Here we journey out to see the world's largest land birds in astonishing numbers at the Colca Canyon. Thank you for watching this video. If you enjoyed our content, please like and subscribe. And we'd love if you could leave us a comment letting us know what you've enjoyed or what you'd like to see more of. And help us grow our channel, become part of the Global Travel Stories family by sharing with friends, family or anyone you think would enjoy our content. Thanks guys.